Welcome to the Mets Pod, presented by Tri-State Cadillac. On today's show, we review the week that was for the big league club, including the reveal of City Connect uniforms, tough injuries, and of course, our scoreboard predictions. We also go down on the farm for updates on Kevin Parada, Calvin Ziegler, and Cowboy Otani, once again, Nolan McClain. As always, we close out the show answering your mailbag questions. So subscribe to the Mets Pod at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, you can watch every episode and leave a question on SNY's YouTube channel or wherever you get your shows. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Mets Pod presented by Tri-State Cadillac. Elevate your style on a Cadillac. Go from bold to bolder in an SUV, from inspiring to awe-inspiring in a sedan. Visit your Tri-State Cadillac dealer today. And subscribe to the Mets Pod at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you'd like to drop us a review, drop us a mailbag question with that review. Watch us on YouTube and also ask your mailbag questions in the comments under the show there as well. I'm your host, Connor Rogers, joined as always by my co-host, Joe DeMeo. And Joe, let's jump right into the week that was. I think before we get into a little bit of uniform talk and injury talk, Let's talk about the actual games. It feels like the Mets had a start of the season where they couldn't win a game, and then they couldn't lose a series. And now they're finally leveling off a little bit here, Joe, playing closer to a 500 baseball team. The week that was is fantastic. I think this all comes down to when when you talk about baseball the way we do on this show, everything is timing. If we did this show Sunday afternoon, we'd have a completely different discussion than we do here on Tuesday afternoon, where obviously the Mets swept the Pirates at home, which was fantastic. Going to LA and taking two out of three, where the Mets, we know the West Coast problems that the Mets have had year over year. And being able to get to Yamamoto a bit on Friday after the conversation we had surrounding him for the entire offseason, I think all in all, it was a great week for the Mets on the field as far as winning games. And we just happened to be talking after back-to-back losses. So it feels just a tad bit different. Yeah, Joe, they've taken some really big series against top competition. I mean, that's the most important thing for this Mets team is just how do you consistently chip away at two out of three, two out of three, two out of three, especially against the good teams. And you brought up the game against Yamamoto. It felt like the damage could have been so much worse. That's some of the most consistent hard contact I've seen this lineup make in a really, really long time. Uh, And, you know, some of the bigger players have gotten going, without a doubt, which we've been waiting on. Now, what's interesting, Joe, as good as things have been for the last two and a half weeks or so, the Mets are really going to be tested going forward right now for two different reasons. One, Francisco Alvarez is going to be down for what we think will be six to eight weeks Uh, with the ligament damage to the thumb. I mean, there's just no replacing Alvarez. I think even more so defensively. We love the pop he has in the lineup. But defensively, the drop-off from him to Narvaez, and now Tomas Nito is back, which gives you a little bit of a boost defensively when you need it, but not much offensively. That's going to be a really, really big test because the days Narvaez has had to play, we've seen teams run at will. We haven't seen the same defensive performance or even the game called the same way as we have from Alvarez, which just goes to show you how impressive he is at this stage of his career. And then one that is even more underrated, in my opinion, Joe, because the lack of length they are getting from this rotation, despite the winning, still not getting consistent length from this rotation. Brooks Raley, it seems like the Mets have avoided the worst with him, but any time that Brooks Raley misses is significant. Because in high leverage situations, Joe, he's untouchable. I mean, this is the guy that if you're looking for the bridge to Diaz that feels like Diaz before Diaz, it's Brooks Raley at this moment. So I'll say this while you can't sound the alarms. The Mets have had, you know, faces step up in this bullpen from unfamiliar places. So it's hard not to believe in the guys that Stearns has found in terms of volume in this bullpen. But it feels like Alvarez and Raley there's no actually replacing those two. It's just staying afloat until they're both back. That's exactly it, es- especially on the Brooks Raley side. He's. It sounds as if he's going to miss the minimum amount of time, which is a good sign because whenever you hear elbow inflammation and you hear you know getting an MRI, especially nowadays with what's happening with pitchers, the alarms really go off. But it sounds like they avoided any uh, structural damage there. So 
I think you're probably more easily able to navigate two weeks without Brooks Raley, obviously, than two months without Francisco Alvarez. Uh, but obviously, you don't want to lose Brooks Raley for any amount of time. Uh, to your point, Connery is probably the most reliable bridge guy that they have to Diaz. And he is so reliable that we almost never talk about him because that's you usually talk about relievers because of the up and down nature. Like Brooks really just goes out there and he's done his thing ever since he put on a Mets uniform. So they'll they'll certainly miss him over the next couple of weeks. But I think they'll be able to navigate through the bullpen for, for that period of time. Um, Alvarez is obviously a significant blow, both to the lineup because of the power potential he has and being the middle of the order hitter that he can be. But to your point on the defensive side, you don't realize quite how good of a defensive player he is until you, you no offense, see Omar Narvaez play regularly. It is it is night and day difference there. I think as the Mets progress forward, and we'll talk about JD Martinez on the way and things like that. I would I would almost lean if Omar Narvaez doesn't pick it up on the offensive side of things. I would make Tomas Nito the starting catcher and make Narvaez the backup to him. And whatever I get from Nito in the nine spot offensively, I get. But at least I know he'll be handling the pitching staff and has the ability to throw out runners. Joe, I'm with you all the way. I think it's something that is not being discussed very much at the moment. But the reality is, like you just said, if Narvaez, who's supposed to give you a little bit of offense from the catching spot, the backup catching spot, but if he's not doing that, then Nito is the better everyday player. Even if he is a basically almost pitcher spot back in the nine hole, having a guy like him defensively that can keep the running game in check that you know is pretty nimble back there and can obviously, he's worked with plenty of these guys or he's worked with a lot of different starting staffs over the years. That trickle effect also goes into the fact of J.D. Martinez could be with this club really soon. And I think... The glass half empty of this episode is that the Mets are going to have to find a way to overcome the Alvarez and Raley injuries in the short term. The glass half full is the Mets have been highly competitive against really good teams without their cleanup hitter in the lineup right now. So there are two really interesting ways to look at it. If Martinez can make it to the big league club and be almost the average version of himself, not even last year but not him from a couple years ago, just somewhere in the middle. The thump that provides until Alvarez is back, and then Alvarez is just a bonus power bat in the lineup at that point, it feels like can really, really help this offense, especially an offense that we know at times, Joe, is going to have to step it up because now I think we kind of have to transition to the rotation a little bit more. Severino is looking good, and he needs to keep building on starts. I think it's been a little bit of a more of a roller coaster with Quintana than we expected. I think Hauser is a guy that is just always that fringe number five. You're going to get days where you go. He gives you a lot of innings. You're going to get days where, and this is kind of his own words the other day after the Dodgers loss on Sunday, didn't give the team a chance at all. When you look at the Hauser situation, is it trending towards that? He's going to just be the auto guy out rather than a Buto or someone like that. When one of, McGill, David Peterson, forgotten man, or eventually even Kodai Senga returns to this rotation, Joe? I think right now it'd be hard to say anybody but Adrian Hauser would be the odd man out. What I will say is the last couple starts happened to be against the Dodgers and Braves, so he did face probably the two best lineups in the National League. So I'll give him just the slight benefit of the doubt there, but largely he's been like you said, just a number five type of starter, which is uh, a generally replaceable commodity. And when we talk about, you know, the potential of Christian Scott coming up, when we talk about the starters coming back, um, I don't think I would shift Hauser out for Tyler McGill, who's working his way back um, from injury. I think I would rather have Hauser in the rotation than McGill. But certainly if we're talking a month from now and everything's going well, other than Hauser, he's obviously the the odd man out when guys come back from injury. Right. That's exactly. I mean, there's just no other real argument. I think when you look at it, because Manaya, I mean, if you look like, right, just show somebody this in March and you said, hey, at this point of the season, everybody's made about four to five starts. Quintana sitting at well, a 4-2-1 ERA. You go, okay, 
Severino's at a 2-1-4. Okay. Manaya's at a 4-1-2. Buto's made three starts and is a sub two. He's a 1-6-5 ERA. Every Met fan would go, you know what? I'll I'll take that right now. Now let, we can't emphasize this enough. Like these guys got to pitch deeper into the games. It's just not sustainable. It's nice when you have the low or average ERAs, but you got to give innings. Then Hauser at a 7-4-5. Like you said, Joe, I mean, yeah, guys are going to get bombed against the lineups that are the Dodgers and the Braves, two of the best lineups in all of baseball. But it almost feels like, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Joe, it reinforces the point that he's your ideal six that, hey, we need a spot starter against the A's or a spot starter against the Marlins or someone like that today, Adrian Hauser, come on up rather than, oh, man, it's the fifth day. Adrian Hauser's got a pitch again, right? Optimally. Like, if you were building yeah. optimally, that would be Easier the case. Easier said than done in this world of arm injuries. Exactly. Everyone, Everyone's getting hurt, and, you know, I know everyone will go back to the Montgomery stuff and looking at Michael Lorenzen, and those guys are obviously uh, pitching for Diamondbacks and, and Rangers now. But when you look at just the general part of the rotation, I decided to look into this, and I think I did my fan graph searching right. I may not have, but I'm pretty sure I did. When we talk about getting more length out of out of starters, while that is true, the Mets are 26th in baseball this year in innings pitched from starters. Last year, they were top 10. Right now, their average is a, a, a hair under five innings per start this year. It's 4.9 change. The Phillies lead all of baseball this year in innings pitched from their starters, averaging six. Last year, the Seattle Mariners led all baseball with five and a half. So <laughs> while I think the Mets and it's they need to be higher on this list than 26, that goes without saying that's the short answer. They need to get more length. But I think we have it in our brains because of our age and growing up in baseball the way we knew it, that it's like they need to go six, seven innings. The harsh reality is the game is trending to – more five inning type of stuff. The third time through the order is often spoken about. So the Mets need to get better, but I also think we need to partially readjust our own expectations of what a starter should do in a given game. I'd like to see a lot more six inning outings than, than they've done. I mean, it's, it's on our scoreboard every week talking about six innings for a whole week of starts. And we're like, is the over under one? <laughs> They're clearly not getting enough. But I also think just big picture, thinking about pitching as, as we move forward, I think we need to also start to reset our expectations of what a starter is in the current game. It's a great point, Joe. It's the game has changed. The sport has changed. The This is goes back to, in my opinion, and I know you, you shared this previously following his work for a long time, the Stearns philosophy of volume in the bullpen. And that's not the guys that make it out of spring training that's almost having a whole nother major league bullpen sitting there in Syracuse and triple a, and you're just flipping guys all the time. And we've seen this with the Mets all year. They've been bringing guys up and down and up and down. And I think that kind of reinforces the fact that one, you're trying to keep your arms healthy Two, right. This is a, just an era now where everybody's trying to throw. Everybody's almost thrown 120%. It feels like every pitch. And you are seeing guys more than ever, and this is without even me pulling up the numbers, but just watching baseball every night and listening to the broadcast. The third time through the lineup is, it's not becoming extinct, but man, is it becoming a lost art. Like, I, even look at the first game of the, the Mets and Giants series last night on the other end, right? When you look at the Giants with Keaton Wynn making a start. Wynn got six innings of one run ball. They put him out there for the seventh inning for the first time in his career, instantly let two runners on base and they pulled him out. And like, this is a dude that had never pitched into the seventh inning in his life before. And they saw two guys get on and they're like, that's it. Like, that's it. This is why we do this. The five yeah. to six innings all the time. So it is a really good point by you that you have to look league wide and the Mets are not alone in this issue. One more thing on the pitching here, because th I think this is something that, not only the fans have been very privy to, and especially if you're a listener to this show, because Joe and I are so minor league focused and prospect focused, but you hear it on the broadcast now too. Christian Scott looming down there in Syracuse. 
Christian Scott, as we sit here and record this through three starts, has struck out over 16 batters over nine at this point. Like, the stuff is unbelievable, Joe. I know this was the guy you were the highest on, even over Vassal, coming into the year out of this system. At what point do the Mets consider using some of his innings this year that are very delicate for a 24-year-old at the moment right now with the big league club? It's another one of those balancing acts that it's tough to make that decision because historically you want a certain quantity of innings in the upper minors before you bring a pitcher up. And Christian Scott is new to starting. Last year was his first year starting since presumably high school. I assume he started in high school, but he was obviously a reliever at the University of Florida. So through 87 and two thirds innings last year, which a reasonable gain for 2024 would be 120, maybe 125. And he obviously has looked great in Syracuse, though his one bugaboo has been the home run ball. He's allowed as many home runs this season so far as he did all of last season. Some of that is just when you get to the upper minors, you can't miss with your fastball. And right. he's done that. He's done that just a few times. Um, but it's something you also, I'm not comparing him. I know I'm going to say some big names here. And I think people will often uh, run and say I'm comparing Christian Scott. But that's something that Jacob DeGrom and Max Scherzer always went through. They wouldn't give up hits. They wouldn't walk guys but they would give up home runs and they're mostly solo home runs. So they're largely harmless. Uh, but you have to balance that of how many innings does Christian Scott need in the upper minors while also be on the supply enough innings to help the major league team. You don't want to waste too many of these bullets at triple a. And to me, I, I think I said this on the show a couple weeks ago. I think Christian Scott is without question, one of the top five most talented pitchers the Mets have right now. And that includes yeah. the players that are on the major league team. So I think uh, I would I would start looking into it here pretty soon. My last memory of Max Scherzer is watching him at City Field in the playoffs give up home run after home run against the Padres, so the game you and I were both at. But in all seriousness, you're absolutely right. Like guys that are aggressive like that, it's I, I respect that way of pitching because it's going to work out for you more often than not, rather than the guys that nibble. And the game's six hours long. And they walked six guys. They pitched four innings and gave up two runs. They navigated around the, the pressure. But then there's a lot of starts in between where they did not. And guys drive in runs. So uh, it'll be fascinating to see how the Mets handle Scott this year. Because he's almost a lever they can only pull once. It's not like you bring up Scott. He has three starts. One of them was really good. Two, One was really average. One was really, really bad. And they're like, okay, go back down to the minors. And we might need you again in August he might really not be pitching a high volume by the time the Mets are in the race, the real grinding race in September. So it's going to be so fascinating to see when they pull that lever. Let's close out the week that was, and we will get to the City Connect uniforms uh, in just a second, with a little temperature check segment this week. R reminder, this is how we always do it here. Hot, cold, lukewarm, subject to hand. Joe, I will give you the floor for the team overall right now. I feel like you, you were hot. When they were zero and five, so I don't I don't know how you give me another answer right now. Oh, it's hot. You know, I think we spend a lot of time right now, and and we do this because we are very professional analysts here on this show. Yeah. So we we think about the sustainability, we think of looking ahead, but there are times where you just have to be where your feet are. And right now, the Mets are playing great baseball, fundamentally sound baseball, largely, and they're winning baseball games and. To me, being a sports fan, if you're not going to enjoy the times when a team is doing well, there's real. what's the point to doing the whole thing if you're just waiting for that domino to fall? So I'll say I'm hot right now, and that's because the Mets are on a good streak. And when we do this here again in a couple of weeks or a month or whenever we do it next, it could be a completely different answer. All right, I'll take the lineup. I And I, I agree with you. It's hard to say anything else about the Mets right now. They've really, really turned this thing around. The lineup right now, I want to say hot. I'm in between hot and lukewarm. And here's the, once again, glass half full situation with the Mets. They have taken two out of three against, obviously, the Reds, um, the Braves, Royals, Pirates, and Dodgers all in a row. And in all of those series... They scored at least six runs in two out of the three games. That's very productive 
right? Like, no matter how we look at it right now, they got shut out Sunday against the Dodgers and they scored two runs against the Giants. The bigger sample size of the last four to five series, if you're getting six runs or more out of two out of every three games, you're probably going to be in pretty good shape. The only reason I say I do trend in between instead of hot, trend in between hot and lukewarm, Joe, is that one, I really need to see J.D. Martinez in a Mets uniform actually get a hit before I'm like fully immersed in that. Two, it feels like they are dangerously trending without Alvarez towards spots in the lineup that just don't give them enough. Now we have one at catcher. Like they get nothing from catcher where it felt like with Alvarez, they were getting quite a bit for what the position is. And then how long can guys like Bader, you know, really stay that kind of hot? That's not something that you think is sustainable. That's not how the team is built to be sustainable. So I mean, two more really great games, and Lindor gets going like crazy. It's right back to hot. But you have to feel okay about the lineup right now. Yeah, I'm actually kind of right where you are, in between lukewarm and hot. And I was going to go lukewarm just because of the loss of Alvarez. And J.D. Martinez being added almost just feels like an Alvarez replacement in a way instead of in addition to. Uh, So I think the Alvarez loss knocks me just down a peg. But like you said, and you said it at the top of the show, Connor, the the good players are starting to play good ball. Marte looks back to form. Jeff McNeil has been great over the last two weeks. He's hitting, I think, over 330 over the last two weeks. So he's playing better ball. Obviously, Francisco Lindor is playing better ball. So I think the offense all in all is fine. It just would have been really sweet to be thinking about this weekend series and J.D. Martinez coming to, to join the team to hit in front of Francisco Alvarez. That was a, an exciting thought that unfortunately we might have to wait a couple months to see. All right, how about the defense, Joe? Where do you stand on that? Again, where we go to the where your feet are, it's cold right now. The Mets are last in baseball in defensive runs saved by, which is a fan graphs measurement for, uh, for defense. And when you're last, that ain't a good thing. So for now, I'll say cold. But I do think a lot of it was some kind of circumstantial stuff like Stalling Marte's not dropping fly balls regularly. You know, guys like Zach Short and Joey Wendell, who are very reliable gloves historically, they're booting ground balls and making bad throws. So it's it's some weird things that I think will work themselves out over the span of the 162. Because I do think they have some very good defensive players on their team. It's just in the early going been a lot of almost like boneheaded plays that – I don't think are something that's sustained over like a six month stretch, though. I love Harrison Bader in center. He's been fantastic. And how many times can we say it? They got worse defensively because the Alvarez injury and the drop, the drop off. This is what's problematic. The drop off from Alvarez to the next guy defensively, unless Nito is going to eventually start, which is kind of our Mets pod, you know, trajectory plan here is as big as any drop-off from position to position, almost, right? Like, even as great as Bader is in center field, Tyrone Taylor and Brandon Nimmo play a pretty good center field. Bader's just elite. Alvarez is a really, really good defensive catcher. Narvaez is a bad defensive catcher. Like, there's no other way you can slice it. And I I think he made some really nice stops throughout the last couple games, but so much of defense is more than just that back there. Let's close out the open here, Joe, with the City Connect uniforms. We've been waiting for the big reveal. You and I are uniform guys. I think it, uh, number one, the actual base color was kind of what we were hoping for, a different format of gray. There's a lot of good they did with this uniform. They didn't overdo the purple, which was everyone's fear when they dropped the teaser of the logo turning purple. What did you think of the Mets and their City Connect partnership with Nike, where I always remind everybody, the wrong way to judge this is like, it's another Mets uniform. I hate it because it doesn't, it's not Mets. The point of city connect is it's totally different from the uniforms you wear every day and have some kind of relation to where you play. So what was your thought on the city connect drop? First off, I think they have the best hat of all the city connect hats that have been released so far. I think they absolutely nailed the, the color scheme with that dark gray. And as the week wore on, you and I talked about it you know, when it first dropped and we had our couple issues here and there that the wanting Queens over NYC, I think is a little nitpicky. I would have rather had it, but I understand the other side of the coin too. Cause there's a lot of people saying, you know, this is for New York. They're not just in Queens. They have fans in all the other boroughs in long Island and all over. So 
I understand that. What really stuck out to me is the the little details. It feels like a lot of the City Connect jerseys are, I don't want to say thrown together, but feel almost thrown together. The Mets one, they paid attention to little details with the tracks in, in the uh, in the pinstripes and all of the little things. I think it's, you know, the City Connects could go really bad. We've seen that where they could be very outlandish. I don't think this stands out as, you know, an elite jersey per se. But I think all in all, Mets, Nike, job well done. And uh, I'm, I already ordered one of the hats, so I'll, I'll have that here soon. I think overall, compared to all of them, it's definitely one of the higher tier ones, right? I really, really like the Miami one, especially when you look into, like you said, Joe, the history with that. Um, I thought the Seattle one is, and even the Astros, like look pretty good and trying to be different, but also staying true to the team. The Rockies was a really, really interesting one because of how different it was. I don't like the green pants, but I really, really like the jersey. With the Mets, I agree with you. They were almost so close to being perfect, and it's a simple for me. I wanted something that said Queens on it, and they went with NYC. I, I get the whole, you know, people that are frustrated, well, is this too close to the Yankees? Here's my hottest take, Joe, because I think the jersey and the hat is like the color format is really, really good. Once again, I would have changed it to Queens instead of NYC, uh, and that would have made it much better to me. I almost feel like they didn't do enough purple. Is that crazy of me to say? I And I was terrified. I'm like, the Mets are going to have these Barney uniforms. Like, it's like Nike hasn't had a real purple uniform yet. They're going to go all out. And I actually looked at them, and I'm like, I can't believe I'm saying this. It needs just a little bit more purple trim. I could have used a little, maybe on that, especially because the teasers all had the NY in purple. So I was exactly. under the thought that the NY on the hat was going to be purple, but there's no purple on other than the, the button thing on top. But I think a little more purple trim would, would not have been a bad thing, but there, that was, that's a tough line to toe. You could, you could quickly go to having too much purple. Yeah. They played it safe. And I have to respect that. You always want to raise the floor of a uniform. Like it's not always about the ceiling because we've seen yeah. some really bad uniforms released across all major sports over the years. And they went with the floor. I'm excited to see what they actually look like. Uh, on the field. It's cool that the players have been involved as well. You're listening to the Mets Pod presented by Tri State Cadillac. Subscribe to the Mets Pod at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SMY's YouTube channel, or wherever you get your podcasts. It's that time of the week, Joe. We go down on the farm, and you know the Alvarez injury makes people ask about another high end catching prospect in the Mets system in Kevin Prada. How's it going for him so far in Binghamton, Joe? It's been okay. Uh, he's focused on his defense. I think his receiving has looked better in the early going than it did, you know, in the middle to the late last season, which we spoke to Kevin Parada when we were down in St. Lucie, and he spoke to the grind of the first pro season. And people forget that he went to the Arizona Fall League as well. Kevin Parada played baseball weeks after the World Series ended, and it was his first pro season. So I think he did get worn down a bit as the season went on. Uh, so I think I'll, I'll continue to monitor the defensive growth that he needs to make. Offensively, he got off to a hot start. He's kind of fizzled a little bit here over the last you know week or two, but he's working counts. He's drawing some walks, still striking out a little more than you'd like. Uh, and the baseline stats certainly don't jump out as something overly exciting in OPS just over 700. Uh, he, he is not a guy that I'm looking at as this guy could come, come help the Mets during Alvarez's absence uh, but you know year two let's continue to monitor what Parada does at the double a level and I'm encouraged by the early signs being shown defensively that's a the defensive metrics that's a really good sign because that's vital for him the good with Prada offensively 392 on base percentage you said it he's drawing walks he's getting on base you just want to see more consistency at the plate and you know the 14 strikeouts in 51 plate appearances like that's a number that has to go down for a guy that was drafted 11th overall and has huge offensive expectations in the majors. I don't think we have really defensive expectations for Parada. It's been a long time since we kind of looked at that. Um, but the offensive expectations are what's significant. Uh, elsewhere in the minors, Joe, really disappointing news. A guy you and I really, really like. The stuff is off the charts. We got to interview him. It feels like when he was uh, like really young, like right after the Mets drafted him. Calvin Ziegler, unfortunately, Joe, 
going to have Tommy John surgery. Yeah, I was able to confirm a report about uh, Ziegler getting Tommy John. And just unfortunate for a kid that worked so hard. It's just been a tough 12 months for him. Um, he entered last season on the injured list due to having off-season bone spur surgery. So uh, he obviously had that. And while he was rehabbing, he tore his quad. And at the time, the thought was, all right, the torn quad, that wipes out his season. His, his season's over. And... He made it a point to the Mets medical staff that I'm going to get into a game before this season ends. And he worked his tail off and he was successful in that mission. He got into one game uh, for St. Lucie, struck out the side, and, and that was obviously at the end of the season. So, you know, goal accomplished. And he reported to spring training and talking to people down there, they said he reported healthy. He was in good condition. His velocity was up. He was touching 98 in bullpen sessions. Uh, he closed out the uh, prospect breakout game that that I was part of for SNY. He got the save in that game, looked really good there, got off to a hot start for Brooklyn. And you know, now, unfortunately, he'll be out for, you know, the next 15, 16 months, which, you know, we're looking at a realistic timeline of the second half of 2025. Uh, just an unfortunate thing. But, you know, this is this is the name of the game with pitchers right now. Unfortunately, injuries are part of the game for them. And you know, while this stinks for the Mets to lose a player like Calvin Ziegler in the system, this now just opens up opportunity. So if you're one of those pitchers that just missed the Brooklyn rotation and maybe you're in long relief, or if you're a pitcher in St. Lucie trying to get up to Brooklyn, this could be an opportunity for you. Ziegler is still just 21 years old. A lot of baseball left for him. I mean, the stuff is just too good right now, Joe, where, you know, you and I think he'll be, he'll be back and be a part of this team at some point in the long, long-term future. Let's close it out with our favorite prospect, our favorite character in the system, Cowboy Otani, Nolan McClain. I know the pitching's been a little bit uneven in his last outing, Joe, but these exit velocities right now for Brooklyn, for the hardest hit balls in 2024, and April 14th, 112.9 miles per hour, April 19th, uh, 112.5 miles an hour and April 20th, 111.7 miles per hour. That ranks first, second, and fourth for the hardest hit balls from Brooklyn this year. Joe, this guy does nothing with half measures. It's either crush the ball a mile or throw the ball a thousand miles an hour. Yeah. Cowboy Otani, uh, is hitting the heck out of the ball there. There's no way around that. And you know, his, his approach at the plate too, in the at-bats that I've watched, it looks improved from what he did at Oklahoma State. We're going to monitor this now as, as we progress forward over the, the coming months because we've talked about it since he was drafted. The strikeout rate is very important. He struck out you know north of 40% of the time in college. That's a scary thing because you know playing at Oklahoma State, he's not facing a ton of professional quality pitching. So it'll be very interesting to follow um, his, his trajectory as far as making contact because as evident by those numbers you just gave when he makes contact uh he's going to hit the ball really hard it's all about barrel control which is something that he has um just natural ability to do and on the pitching side like you said it, it was a bit of an uneven outing he cruised through two innings third inning walked a couple guys wild pitch got into some trouble and then a reliever came in and let in some runs on his behalf but, I mean, this is a guy, when I was watching him, sitting 95 to 96. He was up to 98 miles an hour. He's obviously got that sweeper. And he's working on, you know, a bit of a cutter, trying to get a change, really trying to figure out what that third pitch is for him. Uh, but clearly, when we talk about prospects in the system and the most exciting prospects, while he may not be as high in my current rankings that you could always see on SNY.TV or it's pinned to my Twitter profile, um, may not be so high there. I think he'll be trending up when I do an update probably around midseason. But he's clearly one of the most exciting prospects that the Mets have just because of how unique his skill set is. Remember, New York City public schools are closed this week, which means it's perfect time to grab your kids and head to Coney Island for a Brooklyn Cyclones game. This week, the Cyclones host the Wilmington Blue Rocks, an affiliate of the Washington Nationals. Cowboy Otani, a.k.a. Nolan McClain, is starting Tuesday night and Sunday. And Brandon Sprout is pitching Saturday. So take advantage of Friday offers a ticket and two drinks for 22 bucks. Saturday is halfway to Halloween, dressed in a costume and trick-or-treat around the ballpark. 
And then you have Sunday fun day. First 500 kids get free Mr. Softy plus kids run the bases, plus a coupon for free pizza after the game from De Farina Pizza on Cropsey Avenue. For more details and tickets, visit brooklyncyclones.com. All right, Joe, let's review our scoreboard from last week. Not a good week for Connor, a very good week for Joe. Over under put, that's why he's the reigning champ, folks. Over under push set at two, DJ Stewart hits. Joe, you went over. You're a big, you've always been a big believer in DJ Stewart. I went with a push. He got three. Point to Joe. Over under push at one for Brett Beatty home runs. Joe, you went under. I went with a push. Joe, you were right. You got a point. Over under push was set at six for Francisco Lindor hits. Lindor had six. Joe was right with the push. I went under. Joe, you're just cooking this week. Over under push is set at two for Mets starters going at least six innings. This is the safest money that you could bet anything on. Me and Joe wisely both went under. The Mets had one starter go six innings, one point for each of us. Over under push was at three for Mets wins. We both pushed. The Jet. The Mets had four. No points for either of us. So big doubters in the Mets this week. Over under push is set at one for our final one. Nolan McClain home runs. Six Cyclones games. Joe, you went under. I went with the push. He did not hit one. Big week for Joe, taking five points. He now leads 11-7 to seven on the season for this week. Six games, two against the Giants, three against the Cardinals, one against the Cubs. Joe, you win the week, you get the floor. Over, under, push it two for J.D. Martinez hits. Oh, interesting. So Good luck. The, the expectation is J.D. Martinez will be activated on Friday, which would give him four games to get two hits. Does he uh, play four games, though? Probably not. That's a good I point. I say no. I say plus yeah. three. Yeah, I think he'll get a day off somewhere in between there, maybe the, the Sunday day game. But en en enough delaying. I'm going to push. I'm going to say he'll get two hits in those three games. He'll get a hit in his first at bat. That's the thing I'll say. His first at bat will be a hit. I'm going to push as well because I think this number is really, really like contingent on what they're going to do with Martinez out of the gate. And I think that is, one, he's not playing all four. Might not even play three of the four. And then also, if the Mets get a really big lead or down really big in one of these games, I think they would get Martinez off his feet as much as possible, which limits the at-bats even more so. So two hits for a guy that's been a hitting machine throughout his career. Over-under pushes at one for Brett Beatty home runs. I'm going to go under here, Joe. And it absolutely hurt me last week that Beatty missed some time. And the fact that, to your point, he's kind of tried to do exactly what we hope for, and that's not always try to hit the ball out of the ballpark. So I don't think any home runs for Beatty this week. What do you think? I went zero last week. I've, I've waited a long enough for another Brett Beatty home run, so I'll push. I'll say he'll hit one before uh, we record again next week. How about Starling Marte hit? Set at a high number of five because Marte's been great, Joe. What's interesting for me is Marte's playing every day. Like he looks he's fine. Not, yeah, looks fine, looks healthy, just looks like 2022 Marte. Uh I will I'll push. I'll push 5. I will take the over on this because the Mets have some juicy matchups coming up and if Marte is going to play every day, I think Marte stays hot. Over under pushes at one for Mets starters going at least six innings. I'm going with old reliable here, Joe, and going with the push of one starter goes six innings. His name is probably Luis Severino. Or his name might be Jose Buto. That's but, the two guys. <laughs> yeah, I'll push too. I mean, it, it's hard. Like, like we talked about, the Mets right now are 26th in baseball for innings pitch from a starting pitcher, averaging under five innings per start. Uh, but if you give me one guy to have a good day, I think that can happen. All right, Joe, the over-under push is at three for Reed Garrett appearances. Reed Garrett's been a busy man so far, and he's been really, really good. No Brooks Raley in mine. Mets are going to have to use him a lot. I'll push because I do think regardless of injuries, what Carlos Mendoza has shown is he, ha he has a good feel for when to use relievers, when to give relievers days off. So I think I'll keep the push on Reed Garrett. But uh, yeah, Reed Garrett, fantastic. We can have a bigger discussion about him at some point, but uh, I'll, I'll go, I'll push at three. Yeah, I got to push on this too, because you just can't throw the guy, you know, four to five times out of six games. You, in theory, you might in September or August, if you think he's got a lot in the tank. I don't think that's pretty bad management in April. So, but they need him right now. Like he's got to throw at least three games. So it feels like one of the 
it's always bad to call one of these safe, but it feels like one where you just try to apply as much health logic to it as possible. Over under pushes at three for Mets wins in these next six. Joe, I'm going to go over. They lose the opener to the Giants. I'm not afraid of the Cardinals. I think they can easily take at least four of the next five, honestly. And then you got the bonus game against the Cubs. What do you think here? I'm going over. I'm going to go over, too. I know we've, we've kind of lined up a little more than we usually do this week, but I'm going to go over, too. I think they still can take, I mean, as we record now, they obviously haven't played the Giants, but if they can pull off these two games in San Francisco, that sets nope. them up really well, and it, it'll hit the over pretty easily. All right, one mailbag question to close out this week's show, of course, and we're going to dive into the YouTube uh, comments from last week. This is from user... And a lot of letters and a lot of numbers. I'll say it starts at YG9. Thank you for the question. Will Zach Short be sent down when J.D. Martinez arrives? I think the overall topic of this, Joe, is just the roster management. We heard Carlos Mendoza even say um, early in the week that just because J.D. Martinez is coming up does not mean it's a lock. D.J. Stewart's going anywhere. I think they gave Wendell real money. I feel bad because Zach Short hasn't played a lot, and he's been a great story out of camp, but it's it's almost hard to see anyone else. Am I wrong here? No, you're not wrong. And and the key here, I just want to correct a little language, said sent down, uh, Zach Short does not have any minor league options. So he would actually be designated for assignment. And if he cleared waivers, I believe they can outright him to AAA. Which, which they would love. Yeah, and I feel like he probably would clear waivers. The usage really just tells the story. DJ Stewart, we talked about how good he's been hitting in the middle of the order. It would it would be pretty surprising to see them option a guy that they just hit fifth the other day or whatever as, as a designated hitter who's performing. And Joey Wendell is the veteran. And whenever Bre when Brett Beatty was out, they threw playing time at Joey Wendell. And Zach Short was kind of a a sub that came in and he feels like a guy that hasn't played enough, which to me, I think puts him at the bottom of the, the totem pole there and probably the most likely guy to be uh, moved out when JD is ready. Yeah. It's kind of been a theme of the show. I mean, we talked about how you lose some power in the lineup without Alvarez combined with the fact, I don't think JD Martinez is coming up here and you're just going to ride him into the ground up until Memorial day. I mean, you'll have to during this summer, like the Mets are going to, they brought JD Martinez here to hit every day. But I don't think you want him having any setbacks for a team that needs offense right now. So I don't know if it'll be a full platoon, Joe, between him and DJ Stewart. But you could definitely see a couple days against righties, you throw Stewart out there at DH and kind of manage JD. Yeah, and it allows flexibility too. Like you could play, like Starling Marte will eventually need a day off, right? And you could throw DJ Stewart in right field that day. So him having a little defensive flexibility, I think is a good thing, but him performing the way he has, I think allows the opportunity for you to manage JD Martinez, honestly. And he is a guy that I think is very in tune with his body and very honest with the organization. So I don't think it'll be a situation where they force him into situations where he has a heightened likelihood of getting injured and having DJ Stewart only, um, helps your ability to have that uh, flexibility. This is the Mets pod presented by Tri-State Cadillac. Elevate your style in a Cadillac. Go from bold to bolder in an SUV, from inspiring to awe-inspiring in a sedan. Visit your Tri-State Cadillac dealer today. And remember to subscribe to the show at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Leave us a review with a question, and we'll look for it for a future mailbag. And, of course, you can watch the show on SNY's YouTube channel. So become a subscriber over there. You will never miss a show as they are released. All right, big week for the Mets as the schedule takes a more positive turn, but still got to take care of business no matter who they're playing. For Connor, for Joe, we'll catch you next week.